Hi, I'm Kieran Kelly and welcome to the Christian Institute series exploring the lethal blend of postmodernism and Marxism that is critical theory. In parts one and two, the Institute's social policy analyst, Dr. Sharon James, first explains that critical theory is dangerous and divisive, blurring truth and lies as part of an all-out assault on reality, and then encourages Christians to confront it by confidently proclaiming God's truth. You'll also find out what she has to say covered in this booklet, Critical Theory, Challenging Truth and Reality, or for the very short version, in this leaflet simply entitled Critical Theory. In parts three and four, some of my colleagues and I discuss a number of books that address various aspects of critical theory from either a Christian or non-Christian perspective. I hope you enjoyed the series. If you do, please share the links with others and don't forget to like and subscribe to receive more of our content. Now here's part one, what critical theory is and where it came from. Back in September last year, an American politician called Stacey Adams declared, there's no such thing as a fetal heartbeat. It's a manufactured sound designed to convince people that men have a right to take control of a woman's body. Now, many people here might testify that hearing that unborn child's heartbeat was an awesome, unforgettable reality. It's a biological reality too. A baby's little heart begins beating at around 21 days gestation and ultrasound enables us to hear that heartbeat by around six weeks. But because the issue there being discussed was the issue of abortion, for Stacey Adams, the only relevant consideration was the power of the oppressor class, men, over the oppressed class, women. She would have rejected any appeal to science as a power grab, a way to dismiss the claims and the plight of a woman with an unwanted pregnancy. And increasingly in our culture today, experience, and particularly the experience of those deemed to be oppressed, settles every argument. Just consider, a man doesn't have a womb and cannot give birth to a baby. But just stating that fact in some contexts, you could be accused of hate speech. A transsexual could have felt hurt by that comment. And in any such situation, if the one claiming to be offended is from a victim class, their feeling, their sense of what happened in that interaction is set, believed to be more real than the intent of the person speaking. Their feelings cannot be questioned. Feelings are more important than facts. So we need to understand it's not just biblical truth that's offensive to so many people in our culture today. Many are hostile to the very concepts of truth and reality. Dr. Al Merler writes, we're living in an age in which secular world is unhinged from reality, unhinged from metaphysics, unhinged from truth, unhinged from reality. And another theologian has said of young people today, quote, they're living in a world where they've been left alone in the cosmos with nothing to guide them, not even a firm grasp of what constitutes their basic humanity and no means of finding their way home not even a firm grasp of what constitutes their basic humanity. And behind that breakdown of confidence and objective reality, we see the lies of the evil one. First lie, there is no creator God. Second lie, well, if there's no God, there's not gonna be a judgment. There's no absolute morality. Third lie, if there's no transcendent authority out there, who determines what's true at all? There's no ultimate truth. And all those lies are hardwired into a way of looking at the world that is often described as critical theory. The phrase critical theory may sound academic irrelevant to your life and mine, but although this worldview was birthed in academia, it's given rise now to the culture of identity politics, and none of us can escape from the reach of that. And that's why I'm giving this talk. Firstly, I'll define critical theory and take a look at some of the key thinkers and movements who have influenced this way of thinking. So critical theory was 
a school of thought pioneered by a Marxist study centre founded in Germany in 1923, commonly known as the Frankfurt School. Its manifesto, entitled Traditional and Critical Theory, was written in 1937 by the Institute's first director, Max Horkheimer. He made the distinction between traditional theories on the one hand, the disciplines such as history, science, philosophy, those that seek to understand the world as it is, they're about looking for truth and knowledge and then passing that knowledge on. But distinct from traditional theories, he framed critical theory, which is not so much about seeking to understand the world as it is, as about action, moving the world to where it should be, social justice, equal outcomes. And to get society to that outcome, all the institutions which cur currently prop up the status quo need to be overturned. The overturn of society was conceived by the thinkers of this institution in ideological rather than physical terms. You don't have to start by killing the powerful. Just persuade ordinary people that they are terribly oppressed and then watch back, wait, see what happens. Critical theory represented actually something of a synthesis emerging between Marxism calls for violent revolution and the thinking of such as Freud, which represented calls for a moral and social revolution. Critical theory was designed to enlighten us all to see the way that power structures exploit us, especially those who are in minority groups. And the aim is action, as I say, overturn those structures. How? Well, just spread suspicion and mistrust and division. Encourage people everywhere to see all authority as oppressive and all truth claims as suspect. And so to summarise this first section, critical theory views all variations in outcome in society as the result of structural injustice. Some groups, identified as having privilege, oppress other groups who are identified as being without privilege, hence identity politics. Now, any one individual may experience the oppression of living within multiple different oppressed groups. They may be part of a minority race, a minority sexual orientation, and a minority religion, hence the term intersectionality. Critical theory seeks to awaken us all to the oppression endemic in the institutions of society and to move us towards activism to liberate the oppressed groups. And those who are awakened and who engage in activism are sometimes referred to as woke. Critical theory challenges hierarchies and institutions which exercise authority, and critical theory challenges claims to ultimate truth. Now, if that all sounds abstract, it may help to look at some of the people whose ideas have fed into this way of thinking, and time will only permit a very short selective overview. I provide more detail and quotations from the primary sources in the lies we are told, the truth we must hold. But we'll begin with Karl Marx and the fundamental conviction that religion is a false consciousness. Marx famously argued that religion exists because we are unhappy and alienated in our economic lives. It simply drugs people into acceptance of their miserable lot. Of course, while he was living in London during the 19th century, Marx saw all around him the opium dens filled with people who were seeking to dull their misery. And he thought that was a perfect metaphor for religion. Marx had been deeply influenced by the German philosopher Feuerbach, who argued that God is merely a human projection. We create him rather than the other way around. The idea of God is there to serve as a comfort blanket, to warm and cheer us through the hardships of our miserable lives. Now, Marx, of course, considered every society to be based on an economic foundation, such as capitalism, but that foundation could only be held in place by institutions such as law, politics, family, religion, education, which prop it up. All of those institutions need to be exposed as exploitative and pulled down. Revolutionary activism was the priority. Unfortunately, many Christians and others have often naively read back into Marx their own genuine desire to see greater economic and social justice. 
but Marx should be allowed to speak for himself. Please go and read Das Kapital. And then go and read an immensely powerful book by Paul Kengor entitled The Devil and Karl Marx, Communism's Long March of Death, Deception and Infiltration, which provides extracts from many others of Marx's writings. But our concern here is critical theory, and we note that Marx famously said, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. See there? Activism takes priority over truth. The first generation of Marxists pushed for violent revolution, but those associated later with the Frankfurt School would shift to wanting cultural revolution. And then later advocates of critical theory would turn on and attack Marx's truth claims. But the common motif recurring between each is the idea that religion is a false consciousness that puts a break on the activism that we need to move us towards an equal society. Religion must not be tolerated. And we move on to, now to Antonio Gramsci and his audacious desire to overturn common sense. A founding member of the Italian Communist Party, Antonio Gramsci reflected that Marxists had underestimated the power that bourgeois values had on working people. Those values were passed on through cultural institutions such as schools, colleges, churches, the family workplace and so on. And Gramsci described all of this as the hegemony, from the Greek word to lead. He argued that the hegemony, all of these institutions, keep ordinary people trapped in a false consciousness. It lulls them into complicity, which institution, into a system, going along with a system which institutionalizes inequality. And the values created by that hegemony, power structure, are so embedded in Western culture that people think of them as common sense. Ideas which sustain this psychological oppression are passed down from generation to generation, primarily through parents. But it seemed to many impossible that this entire cultural mindset could be overturned. Gramsci reflected it would be a huge task to launch, quote, a cultural movement which aimed to replace common sense and the old conceptions of the world in general, end quote. But he reckoned it could be done. The dominance of common sense could ultimately be toppled. A few determined people can achieve revolution if they succeed in changing ideas. You just start in the university lecture rooms, and then you stand back and watch as those ideas spread through society. Now, as already mentioned, a Marxist study centre had been founded, it was established in Germany in 1923. A very safe sounding name was chosen for the institution, the Institute for Social Research. The historian Mark Sidwell describes this institution as, quote, an academic hothouse that was willing to think the unthinkable and reconceive Marxist theory, and whose intellectuals were willing to imagine that the best way to serve Western civilization might be to destroy it, end quote. The first director of the Institute was the philosopher and sociologist Max Horkheimer. And underlying every aspect of thinking at the Frankfurt School was Horkheimer's conviction that there is no transcendent reality, there is no God. The whole world of perception is just a world of human activity. We make our own reality. Horkheimer coined the term critical theory and hostility to Christianity is hardwired into this way of thinking. Because truth, morality, justice, ideas about universal human rights, they're all believed to be human constructs, not transcendent and eternal realities. They have been constructed in order to sustain the hegemony. There is no God. And so humans have cooked up these ideas such as universal human rights or free speech. And if we've constructed those ideas, we can deconstruct them as well. Theodore Adorno took over as director of the Institute in 1953. And he and the first director, Horkheimer, shared the conviction that the influence wielded by academia, the law, the church, the press in propping up the establishment could be undermined by critical theory. And their target was the whole framework of ideas 
holding up free Western societies. They were convinced that the problem with free societies was that people were free to sort themselves into hierarchies. Freedom is dangerous. Now, I would suggest to you that societies need certain hierarchies of competence if the systems on which civilization rests are going to function efficiently. But Adorno regarded all hierarchies with suspicion, describing them as, quote, illusory harmonies. What did he mean by that? He meant, well, people may imagine that it's just great to live in a functioning society, but in reality, he said, the pseudo-stability of well-functioning Western societies disguised as a rotten reality. Multitudes are psychologically oppressed by inequality. And in order to end this oppression, society's stability has got to be shaken. The ideas underpinning it have to be challenged. And you can do that if you undermine people's confidence in ultimate truth. But how do you set about doing that? Step one. Persuade people that they're all trapped in a false consciousness. They may think they're happy, they're not. They're being exploited by self-interested, powerful forces. They're trapped in a false consciousness and need to be awakened to their plight. Step two. Persuade people that the institutions that hold society together, family, schools, church, associations, government, are evil and exploitative. In 1950, Theodore Adorno published his book, The Authoritarian Personality. The traditional family was pre presented as a repressive institution which brainwashes people into giving up their individual liberty. It conditions them into accepting authority. That makes them susceptible to submitting to dictators. All traditional ideas about the family, religion, patriotism were presented as pathological and all authority was viewed as fascist. So step one, persuade people they're trapped in a false consciousness. Step two, persuade people that institutions are evil and exploitative. Step three, undermine belief in absolute morality. Now this was genius. Adorno redefined the concept of phobia. Properly, a phobia is an irrational fear, but he made it refer to moral disapproval of certain behaviors. And he then associated phobia with bigotry. That was a masterstroke in manipulation of language, because if you control the language, you control the debate. Undermine belief in absolute morality. It became acceptable to assume that people who believe that certain behaviours are immoral have phobias against people in minority groups. People who believe in morality are acting as the oppressor class, keeping the oppressed class down. And step four, tell people that free speech is dangerous. What if some stubborn people continue to believe in absolute morality and ultimate truth? They can't be tolerated. They must be silenced. And here we turn to Herbert Marcuse. Like others associated with the Frankfurt School, Marcuse drew together the ideas of Marx and Freud to demand a non-repressive society liberated from traditional moral norms. Demanding political liberation and sexual liberation proved to be an absolutely mesmerizing combination, a combination which fueled many of the student protests during the 1960s. Marcuse's lecture, Repressive Tolerance, 1965, claimed that the current state of society justified, quote, strongly discriminatory tolerance on political grounds, including the cancellation of the liberal creed of free and equal discussion, end quote. Tolerance must be challenged. Marcuse argued that when people in power talk about free speech or civil liberties, it's simply a ploy to protect their privilege. Minorities are powerless, so we have to give them special privileges. That rebalancing of power is much more important than civil liberties. Revolutionaries understand that priority, but other people ne may need to be re-educated. Continuing the theme of no God, no absolute morality, the existential movement made individual experience supreme. Each person is to seek their own authenticity. In 1948, the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre gave a lecture entitled Existentialism is a Humanism, and it sums up his worldview. Existence 
precedes essence. Now, by essence, Sartre was alluding to the whole system of ideas, patterns, and ideals governing individuals and society. And he said that I, the individual, should not have to conform to any essential idea, for example, of what being a man is, that is imposed on me by parents or priests or teachers. No, no, no. Individuals don't have to conform to rules and expectations. We make our own, rule, our own rules, but we can even define our own essence. We don't have to conform to the ideals of those around us in society. There's no transcendent God. So there's no external authority to dictate to us who we are or what we are. If God does not exist, we are free. And the ultimate conclusion is no forbidding is allowed. And those same themes, no God, no absolute morality, no ultimate truth, are all found in the work of French philosopher and author Michel Foucault. Foucault famously set out to examine how people through history have thought of certain concepts such as crime or criminality or insanity or health. Foucault concluded that those ideas have varied so much over time that ultimately we have to conclude that everything is relative. Now this brutally exposed the utter failure of the Enlightenment project the modernist project, it just showed that the liberal project was doomed because any effort to answer all questions by unaided human reason, absent God, will ultimately prove unstable. When you deny God, the ultimate foundation of absolute morality and ultimate truth is fatally undermined. But Foucault's response, of course, was not to return to divine authority. Oh no. Rather, he pushed rejection of God to the ultimate limit and blurred all moral and intellectual boundaries. For example, Madness and Civilization, 1961. If you read that, it shakes any confidence in what sanity actually is. Can we say there's such a thing as madness at all? What is reason? What is unreason? Who's to judge? Labeling some people as insa insane is simply a power ploy by the oppressor class to keep others oppressed. And as we think of the different ways of thinking of madness or sexuality or crime through the centuries, Foucault claimed that those who are in power always organise things and are, it, are, use language in such a way as to protect their own position. For example, if anyone talks about, uses the language of marriage as the natural union of a man or a woman and a woman, that's using language in an oppressive way to demonise homosexuals. Now, Foucault's legacy is the idea that knowledge is a ploy used to keep the privileged in positions of power. Truth claims may be true or false, but how would we know? Truth is a cultural construct. We can't escape from the fact that we all may be complicit in speaking in ways that actually express systemic power. We may be unconscious of this, but we're still guilty, and we need sensitivity training to make sure that we become aware of our guilt. I mentioned earlier the student protests of the 1960s. Rudi Deutschke was one of the student leaders in Germany, and he realised that violent activism had precisely zero chance of pulling down the establishment. And so in 1967, Deutsche came up with a powerful new slogan calling for the long march through the cultural institutions of Western society. Now, the students of the 1960s had sadly, grown up in a culture which effectively was telling them there is no God. And they rightly sensed that man can never live by bread alone. And some of them rebelled against what Marcuse had famously described as, quote, the hell of the affluent society. But instead of turning back to God, their response was nihilistic. Let's smash down what's left. Let's enjoy absolute freedom, absolute equality amid the ruins. In 1979, an academic called Jean-Francois Lyotard wrote a book entitled The Postmodern Condition. Modernism's failed. The Postmodern Condition. It had been commissioned by several universities in Quebec and Canada. Lyotard later admitted that he had very little knowledge of the topic. To compensate, he'd invented stories and referred to books he'd never read. And he described this book as a parody. But it was widely quoted. And it promoted the idea that universal explanations meta-narratives are ways of legitimizing 
institutions of power. Throw away the big stories. Instead, insult, consult individual stories, personal stories, personal experiences, especially non-privileged ones. And the multiplicity of those experiences opens up the prospect of multiple contradictory truths. Now, we've considered some of the key thinkers and movements who contributed to the breakdown of confidence in absolute morality and ultimate truth. Yes, inconsistencies abound, and there's no straight line genealogy between them all, but what matters to us is the cumulative effect. During the 20th century, first universities and then all of the institutions of Western society were invaded by the virus of radical doubt. Intellectual elites increasingly dismissed truth claims as stupid, naive, ignorant, even evil. The movement calling for deconstruction claimed that human language doesn't necessarily relate to objective truth at all. It's a series of linguistic signs to be interpreted by the hearer or reader. This claim was usually clothed in such pretentious language that students were intimidated into thinking they should accept it without question. And it's nonsense. Words do reflect relate to objective truth. But remember, the pioneers of critical theory had set out to destroy common sense. They regarded it as part of the false consciousness that upheld the hegemony. hegemony. The task before them had seemed formidable. But I ask you, what's happened to common sense assumptions? How about the idea that a boy can't be a girl? Such common sense assumptions may today be dismissed as illusions even denounced as heretical. And that represents the triumph of critical theory. Thanks for watching. Part two is available now and Sharon will delve a little more into critical theory, its impact on the church and how Christians should respond. Don't forget, you can also get hold of the booklet, Critical Theory, Challenging Truth and Reality, and the shorter leaflet on our website at christian.org.uk forward slash critical theory. For more great content, like, subscribe and hit the notification bell.